Good morning. Welcome to the Dignity Bible Study. Turn to Philippians chapter 4. This is part 3 in Philippians chapter 4. Chapter 4. Henry Ford, got a quote for you from Henry Ford. <clears throat> he said that thinking is the hardest work there is, which is why so few engage in it. Did you have a teacher growing up who talked about putting on your thinking cap? Where well, you like me, you had somebody, maybe it was a parent, maybe it was a teacher, they said to put on your thinking cap. What did it mean to put on your thinking cap? To, yeah, pay attention, right? Use your mind, that this is time to focus and get with it, right? I wish you really could get one, right? Wouldn't that be nice if you could really have one when you feel unorganized or you feel like a little scattered or something, you could put on your thinking cap and it would help you focus your mind. We're going to talk about our minds today. Let's pray together. If you'd like, repeat this prayer after me. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe in the power of your word to change my life. Make me more like you through your word today. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So were you here last week or did you see the video from last week? We talked about the peace of God which passes all understanding. I've always loved that phrase from the scripture, the peace of God that passes all understanding. When you really think about how it passes all understanding, what that means is that we can't not accomplish that kind of peace with our human minds. I mean, by definition, if it passes our understanding, we can't accomplish that ourselves. It's a supernatural thing, right? It's something that he gives us, that peace that passes all understanding. So don't be anxious about trying to accomplish it and think that you can accomplish it with your own mind, right? It's something that you pray about and you ask for and you enter his gates with thanksgiving, but then he gives it to us and we receive that peace that passes understanding. But then what happens in our minds when we are experiencing that kind of peace? Other religions are trying to accomplish peace like that, but they're trying to accomplish peace where their minds go empty, right? You think about other religions that have transcendental meditation or whatever it is you know or they experience that what they're trying to get to is an emptiness of mind that's not what we're talking about the peace of God that passes all understanding is not a peace where your mind goes empty or passive we cannot overcome anxious thoughts with the use of our minds alone the peace of God is beyond our understanding we can't do it with our understanding Receive the peace of God through prayer with thanksgiving. It is a gift. It's a miracle from God. So let's, test, let's talk about what that looks like. Do you have trouble turning your mind off sometimes? Does your mind race with the same thoughts over and over again? We need this supernatural peace of God that's beyond our understanding. We have to believe our hearts and minds are still active with the peace of God and not passive or empty. That peace of God guards our hearts and minds so that it doesn't make them empty or unfruitful. What's happening in our hearts and minds when the peace of God comes upon us? We rejoice, we present our requests to God. This is all from last week, right? We rejoice in the Lord, we present our requests to God, we enter with thanksgiving, and then it comes upon us so we're going to talk about this week what happens in what our minds can be active with as a result of experiencing the peace of God. So we're picking up right after that peace of God coming upon us and it guarding our hearts and minds. So what happens next? Let's look at Philippians 4, 8 and 9. Follow along in your copy. It says, finally, brothers and sisters... Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing or lovely, whatever is good or of good report, commendable, admirable. I feel like the Amplified Bible right now. I'm not really reading from the Amplified Bible, but I'm filling in all these extra words. If there is any excellence, if anything worthy of praise, think about these things. As for the things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace 
will be with you. I'm wearing a bracelet today that I got when my daughter Sophia was in sixth grade. Misty um, taught the Bible study for the sixth grade girls in her class, and um, it was called Girls with God. And they memorized these verses, and so they put it on here, and they called it Thurpgu. T-H-R-P-P-G-E-W. That's what my bracelet says here. Thurpgu. That's how you remember this. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is of good report, whatever is excellent or worthy of praise, think on these things. Thurpgu. And ever since then, I have this little bracelet in my bed, bedside table drawer, right? You know, Thurpgu. And uh, this whole... Book of Philippians, I've been looking forward to this week when I get to talk about Thurt Pagu again. It's been many years since she was in sixth grade. She's in grad school now. Uh, but finally, brothers and sisters, it says, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, Thurt Pagu. I, um, and, and it's hard to uh, find a translation that does it exactly like Thurt Pagu. I, I don't think I actually found the, uh, the one. But that's the best way I've found to memorize it is to put some kind of pneumatic device to it. But he says, finally, brothers and sisters, or yours, your translation may say, dear brothers and sisters. It's just another reminder that this is such a love letter from Paul as he's writing to this group of people. He really loves them and cares about them. And he's, it's like he's pleading with them here at the end of the book. And he's, he has this one final thing that he wants to share with them. He's like, this is his last major point here in the book. We're getting to the close of this book. And he says, fix your thoughts on these things. Fix your thoughts. An another translation might be meditate. Uh, it's like ruminating on something, right? It's to roll it over and over again in your mind, the original word for think here, or to fix your thoughts, is the word legazomai. I don't know if that's the right way to pronounce that Greek word, but lega. When you look at it spelled, it's maybe even better. Um, it's L-O-G-I-Z. It looks like our word for logic, legazomai. It's, a, it's logical thinking. It's to concentrate logically. It's to reason logically so that our actions are based on carefully thought out principles. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's what we're talking about today. It's that kind of thinking. And how do we think and have our minds be active about that kind of thinking today? It sounds like what King Solomon said. King Solomon was the wisest man. In my Bible reading, I'm reading through King Solomon and building the temple and gathering all my reading yesterday was about the Queen of Sheba coming to visit King Solomon. He was the wisest man that ever lived, right? And what he said was, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So our thinking is what determines who we become. That's Proverbs 23, 7, if you're taking notes. And actually what we find, that's Old Testament, that's King Solomon, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. But what we find out is that thinking is paramount in the Bible. The way we think is paramount in the Bible. We could go, I'm about to give you some verses. Well, I'll just give them to you now. My point is basically that the Bible commands us to think. If you're taking notes, write that down. The Bible commands us to think. Some of the verses are Isaiah 1.18. He says, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Jesus said, learn of me. Peter said to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hosea the prophet said, my people, my people perish for lack of knowledge. It didn't say my people perish for lack of zeal. You would think a prophet would say that. You know what I mean? The prophet is there to fire you up and to give you that passion. The prophet has the fire of God in his bones, right? In his belly and he's got to proclaim it. But he didn't say, my people perish for lack of zeal. He said, my people perish for lack of knowledge. And that is using our minds. We're commanded to think. We're commanded to use our thoughts to become uh, more like Christ. Excuse me. We're commanded to think. 
Another example, Paul said in Colossians to think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. What did Paul say earlier in this book of Philippians? He said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Talking about our minds. Uh, Jesus said to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. In Hebrews it says to fix your mind on Jesus. Same concept that we have here in our passage today about fix your thoughts on these things. (coughs) It's to fix your minds on Jesus the author and the perfecter of our faith. That's just a um, passage that gives me so much hope. The author and the perfecter of faith. When I'm praying for my kids, if you're praying for your kids or you're praying for your grandkids or whoever you're praying for, remembering that Jesus is the author and the perfecter of their faith gives you a lot of hope, right? You don't have to do it yourself. If you want to break that anxiety, anxiety that you have about your kids or your grandkids, Fix your mind on Jesus and remember that he's the author and the perfecter of your own faith and he's the author and perfecter of their faith and turn that over to him. So we find, my point is that the Bible commands us to think and we have all those passages about our thought life and our thinking, but today we really have a detailed list. Today's passage doesn't just say think or you are what you think. Today's passage tells us what to think about. This is probably a very key passage. I don't know, I couldn't think of another passage that gives us so much detail about what to think about. We have quite the list here today. We have six or seven things to think about. It's kind of like in other passages when we have, you know, there are a lot of passages that talk about spiritual warfare and that talk about, the spiritual battles that we're in and all, but then we have that one passage, right, that gives us the armor of God and it gives us the belt and the breastplate and the boots of the gospel of peace, right, and the helmet of salvation and the shield of faith and the sword of the spirit. Gives us a list of all those things. We talk about living in the spirit a lot, but then we have a list that gives us what? The fruit of the spirit, right? And it lists out all those things. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, right? We have certain passages that are kind of those key passages. So I've given you a lot of passages today about how to think and about how to use our minds and how important it is to use our minds. And that's what Pastor Randy was talking about today is using your mind. And that's whatever you're thinking about is what you end up doing. So, but today we have a list. We have whatever is, whatever is, whatever is, whatever is. And then there's two more, right? Whatever is and whatever is. So this is an important list today of what to think about, not just to think, but what to think about, to, what to fix our thoughts on. We're to fix them on what is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely. If there's anything excellent, if there's anything worthy of praise, think on these things. Quite the list, more detailed today than any of these other passages that I've been giving you. Our thoughts. And we need to put these thoughts into the loop in our minds. We all have this loop in our minds, right? That's why anxiety is such a powerful thing. is because it's this loop in our minds and we get it stuck in that loop, right? But what we're doing today is we're feeding that loop. We're feeding it and filling it with the right things. We're filling it with these things. And then that will change how we live. So really there's an there's a amazing similarity between anxiety and meditation. Right? Anxiety or worry is getting in that loop and just spinning on that loop of those obsessive thoughts, those fears, those doubts. That loop is based on false things, really, right? Or things at least that we can't control. Even if it's true, the thing that you're fearful of, even if it could happen, if you're experiencing anxiety on that and it's looping, it's because it um, is out of our control and we need to break that loop. And instead, meditation would be to feed that loop. And it's the same kind of cycle. You're in that loop, but you're meditating on what is true and what is honorable and what is right and what is pure instead 
of those illogical things that are in the loop. So there's amazing similarity between anxiety and meditation. So we're trying to feed that with these things. Isn't it interesting that he says it so many times, this word whatever? Now, some English translations don't list the word whatever six times. The one, my favorite translation right now is the New Living Translation, and it doesn't list whatever six times. It just says whatever one time, and it lists all six things out after that. But I went back and looked in the Greek language, you know, it's listed, that word is repeated six times. Whatever, 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 <laughs> over and over and over again. I think that was for emphasis. When he says it over and over and over, it just starts uh, making sense to us, right? Whatever is, whatever is, whatever is, whatever is, whatever is, whatever is, right? Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is of good report. So let's look at these six things. These are like six categories of assessment. Six cate this is the more detailed list of what we're to think about. So let's look at these and, and take them as assessment in a sense in our life. It's like a filter for us in a sense. Let's look at this first one. He said... Fix your mind or think about whatever is, the first one is, true. So how do we know what is true? It's becoming more and more difficult in the world today to know what is, in true, what is true. It's more important than ever that we know what is true. We need to know the truth and not get sucked into a lie, but it's harder than ever. How do we believe the news, Right? It's a big thing about fake news right now. And really, we've really, by and large, we've lost trust in being able to believe anything on the news. And for good reason, really, because there's these things now that they call deep fakes. Have you learned? I was just learning about that this week. What a deep fake is. What is a deep fake? A deep fake is something that they can do... You know the technology that they have? You've probably seen the little filters and stuff like on Instagram and Snapchat and those kind of things. And when you look at the little filter, it puts like ears and whiskers on you, you know, and stuff like that. And you look like an animal or whatever. Have you seen those things? Even if you're not on, those, on that technology, you've probably seen that where they look at it. And the technology is there where the, what it does is it follows your face and it, and it puts those things on you, right? And it follows your expressions as well. And it changes with your expressions. And it puts that on you. Well, now the technology is like 100 times better than that, right? To where they can take somebody's face and put it on top of somebody else's face. It's called a deep fake. They can put Donald Trump's face on somebody else. And it can just mirror that person's movements and expressions and all that stuff. And if they have five minutes of audio... There's more than five minutes of audio of Donald Trump out there, right? <laughs> it kind of got a little too real for me because these are on YouTube, right? And all that. So there's five minutes of audio of me out there. You know what I mean? They could take my face and take five minutes of audio. There's already been more than five minutes today. And make me say anything in the whole English language, right? With five minutes of audio. That's a deep fake where they could take somebody's face, put the picture on it, take the audio, make them say anything that they wanted them to say. So how do you believe that? How do you know whatever is, how do you know what is true? And be able to believe it when we live in that kind of technology today. It's the growing world of AI or artificial intelligence, right? Next time I get to preach, I'm gonna try to talk about artificial intelligence. I've already asked Pastor Randy, can I talk about that and the theology of that and what do we do with that? And so I'm getting excited about that. I was studying that again yesterday. But I won't get into all that just yet. But just know it's really becoming hard to know what is true in this world. But our focus for our minds is to focus on whatever is true. That's the first thing. The good news we have is that Jesus is the truth. He doesn't just know the truth, he is the truth, right? He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except by me. So that's the hope and confidence that we have in that. The next thing is, 
Well, before I leave this first category, it's, remember I said it's a category of assessment, so we got to know what is true and what is false. Thankfully, though, I think most people still have this category, or at least they want this category, right? They at least want it for themselves to know what is true and what is false. So people kind of understand this category. The next category, the category of honor, I don't think as many people have this category as honor, right? This is a less common category or assessment. Not all of us use this. We don't really have a culture of honor anymore in our society. We yell and scream at each other and uh, we don't show respect. Another word for this would be to show respect. But what if we had a culture of honor? What if we learned and we thought about what is honorable? Next category, the third one is right. Whatever is right. Think on these things. I think like truth, this is a category that we still want to have and is still pretty much accepted by most people. Whatever is right and wrong. We do want justice. We still want truth and we still want justice. We don't really have that category of honor as much. And then also the next category, category of purity. Whatever is pure. This is not necessarily a category that we have. This is a lost category of assessment for us. Whatever is pure. It's not used by everyone today. It's become very um, <clears throat> relative, right? What's pure for you is pure for you. What's pure for me is pure for me. Uh, with the amount of sexual perversion that we have, the amount of, you know, because of our uh, entertainment industry, that, that is never satisfied. It's insatiable, right? And so that category of pure. But that's why we need this. That's why we need to fix our thoughts on what is pure. And we need to learn what it is and remind ourselves. We need truth. We need honor. We need what is right, what's wrong, and then we need what is pure. Just these first four categories, what a difference that would make for us if we could focus on whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure. Just those first four things. The next one is whatever is pleasing or lovely. Lovely is the most used translation of this word. Pleasing fits Thurpgu because there's two P's in Thurpgu, but it's pleasing, lovely, beauty. So we're, we're supposed to think about whatever is pleasing, beautiful, lovely. The opposite would be to think about what is grotesque or ugly. And there's a lot of grotesque and ugly and dark things that have become attractive to people, right? They'll put it on a t-shirt. They'll put it on their, you know, social media, whatever else. It, it's, they're, they're, there's this fascination with the dark and the ugly and the grotesque. But our minds are to be fixed on whatever is lovely. The next thing is a good report. Your translation may say admirable or commendable. Now this category, if we're using this category as a category of assessment as well, this kind of broadens the category because it's not as absolute. Like the category of whatever is true, there are things that are just true and that are just false, right? There's not a lot of gray with truth and false. There's not a lot of gray with whatever is right and whatever is wrong in this third category here. There, maybe beauty is in the eye of the beholder and there's a little bit of a little bit of variation with whatever is lovely or beautiful, right? This one about whatever is commendable or admirable, just because somebody else admires something doesn't mean I have to admire that thing, right? So this one's kind of a little bit broader of a category. So we can't always think about what somebody else admires or commends, but we are not to focus on what is offensive, and so, it doesn't matter what people recommend to us. We are to focus on what is admirable to the Lord. And I think as we fix our minds on Jesus, and, as, and after we have fixed our minds on what is true, 
And after we have fixed our minds on what is noble or honorable, and after we've fixed our minds on what is right, and after we've fixed our minds on what is lovely and is of... <coughs> then when we get to this one about whatever is a good report, or admirable or commendable. I kind of like the good report, not just because it's the G and Thurp goo, but the good report is also, it's like the good report is like the gospel almost. You know, like it's a witness. The good report is like a, a good word that you're able to give somebody else, a good report, something that's commendable. Let's focus and fix our mind on those things. Not what everybody else might say is commendable, but what the good report that the Lord gives us. We're always ready with a word to give about the Lord. And then the last two things, whatever is excellent and worthy of praise. These are kind of separated a little bit. You have the first grouping, and then it kind of, these final two things are kind of a, a in summary fashion. To kind of just kind of summarize, whatever is excellent and whatever is worthy of praise. Think about these things. Just getting through these first four or five in the list is enough for me at the moment, right? <laughs> but then he just kind of wraps it up at the end and says, whatever is excellent, whatever is worthy of praise. Think about these things. This is what you need to put in your loop, in your mind. You need to punctuate your day like this, too. When you wake up in the morning, think about these things. When you go to sleep at night, think about these things. Don't make the last thing you think about at night on your phone be some kind of scary show that you're watching on Netflix, right? And you go to bed fearful about what's about to happen, the cliffhanger. Sometimes if I'm watching a show, I'm not saying don't ever watch a show. Sometimes if I'm watching a show like that, I'll even stop it five minutes before the end of the show. Because it's like, I want to stop before, I can tell there's about to be this big crescendo and they're about to leave me on a cliffhanger and get me to click and watch the next one and binge the show, right? So I'll kind of stop right five minutes before. And then I'll pick up when I, when I uh, watch the next show. I'll pick up right there, you know what I mean? And then I go through that little thing and go to the end. I don't know why I told you all that. But uh, my point was don't put that fear, don't put that, whatever, you know, like before you go to sleep, say a prayer, read a scripture. Um, think about things that are true and honorable and right, and good, you know, things that are pure. Think on these things, he said. All of this has been verse 8, Philippians 4, verse 8. Let's look at Philippians 4, verse 9, and we'll wrap up with this. He's continuing on with this. This is such an important list, like I said earlier. This is not just telling you to think. This is really giving you a list of things to think about. But look at what he does in verse 9. He doesn't stop. He keeps going. He says, as for the things you have learned, we have another list here. The things you have learned, received, and heard, and seen in me. I think he has purpose for this list. To give us these four things, he's really driving this home for us. He said, the things that you've learned, received, heard, and seen... He says, practice these things. There's another good word is practice. Not just the word do. You could summarize our whole teaching today with the words think and the word do. The first verse in verse 8 is think about these things. Then the second verse is do. But even deeper would be the word meditate. Put it in the loop, right? And then the word practice. Because practice means... You're living it out, right? Or live it out, however you want to do it like that. But this, I, I can't skip past this list of learn, receive, hear, and see. Paul is really putting himself up there as a model. And I think that tells us we need to have a model. We need to have somebody that we're looking to like that. Now, you're not going to always see the right things in their life. If you use somebody, anybody, you're going to see them do something wrong sometimes, right? Or you're going to see them um, have a bad attitude some days, whatever else. But when you see in him, he said, when you see this in me, put it into practice. He said, follow me as I follow Christ. What a goal that would be. 
But he says, learn, receive, hear, and see. I think there's, and I'm still digesting what that means. If you dig deep on your own this week through this passage again, look at that again. What does it mean? What is God saying to me about learning, receiving? Some things we learn by revelation, right? We have to receive it through revelation. We don't just get it. Our human minds aren't enough. We have to get it by revelation. So we learn something, we receive it, we hear it, and we see it. It goes from being abstract to very realistic. By If we hear it and see it in somebody's life, then we really know how to do it for ourselves. But then, even during the last uh, church service, while I was sitting there, I started typing this out. <laughs> I'll confess. I was trying to listen at the same time. But it was like in the last service, because it meshed so perfectly with what we were talking about here, about think and then do. Um, the Lord was showing me that you can kind of merge these two lists. <laughs> Our first list was truth, honor, right, pure, lovely, these things, right? What if we took that list and this list and we merged them together? Because then he comes back through with the second list and he says, learn, receive, hear, and see. So what basically we could say, we need to learn truth. We need to learn honor. We need to learn what is right. We need to learn what is pure. We need to learn what is lovely. We need to learn what is of good report. And then... We need to receive what is true. We need to receive what is honorable. We need to receive what is right. We need to receive what is pure. And then we need to hear what is true. We need to hear what is honorable. We need to hear what is right. We need to hear what is pure. And that's a good filter. That would change what we listen to if we focused on hearing only what is right and true and honorable and pure and lovely. And then what we would see what is true, see what is honorable, see what is right, see what is pure. Are you tracking with me about merging these two lists and how you could do that? <coughs> this is how we think on these things. This is how we really think and change and walk this out. I think this list is so important. I've always known how important this list was. <clears throat> but this list doesn't sound exactly like any other list, does it? I thought, well, can I match up and equate this list with the armor of God. Well, a lot of ways you can, because there is truth, the belt of truth, and then we have true. Uh, there is what is right is the third one, right? And we have the breastplate of righteousness. But the, the seven things in the armor don't match up to the seven things on this list, right? Exactly. I tried to match it up with Psalms 19. I love Psalms 19. I think I put it here in my notes, this is, this is going to be my closing application is Psalms 19. Where is it? Psalm 19 says, The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. Um... It is radiant, giving light to the eyes. I'm doing all this by memory. I don't find it in my notes here. But there's very, there is very much a similarity between the two. So I think that just teaches us that we need to think about the Word of God and put the Word of God into us and meditate on it. <clears throat> but it doesn't match up exactly the same list. But I don't think that matters that it has to be the same list. Oh, here it is. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. That's Psalms 19, 7 through 9. So if you were to put that into your mind before you go to sleep at night, that would cause you to think on those things even all through the night. So that's our application now, is to put these things into practice. To learn these things, 
receive these things, hear these things, and see these things, but then put them into practice, and that will change who we are based upon what we do with our minds. Let's pray and ask the Lord to do that within us. Father God, we cannot do this ourselves. We believe that this is beyond our understanding. But would you do this for us? Help us to learn these things. Help us to receive these things. Put this revelation that we've talked about today, put it into our hearts and minds. Help us to never forget these things and how important it is. And then help us to, um, to do these things, to practice them, to live them out in front of other people. I pray that other people would be able to learn and receive and to hear and to see from us. I pray that blessing over each person that's here, each person watching this. Even if they're watching it later on, I pray that they would be people that uh, live this out for other people to see. We thank you for doing this in our lives. We believe you to do it. We need you. Otherwise, we live in darkness. Otherwise, we live with a lie. We live in dishonor. We live in what's wrong. We live in what is um, ugly and grotesque. The opposite of all these things. So we choose by faith to live with what is true, with what is honorable, with what is right, with what is pure. We believe you and receive these things and ask you to make that the craving and desires of our heart, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.